Welcome to Philosophy of Value Workshops number 43 of series 7. The question for today is can either value pluralism or value monism justify normative moral judgments? Reading from one of my works, The Pursuit of Value, chapter 6, section 3. In these workshops, I'm advocating a controversial view for the modern world of a unified answer to human life. This isn't a unified answer to psychological problems, medical science, physics or metaphysics. But it's a unified answer to issues of value like ethics, morals, meaning, purpose and aesthetics. Such a claim risks being dismissed out of hand. But I ask for my evidence, here and elsewhere, to be considered before being dismissed. Part of my claim is that, despite being the key concept in ethics, aesthetics, meaning and purpose, value has been overlooked as an explanatory principle which is now able to unify and resolve these issues. More specifically, I'm advocating a principle of value as an affirmation or will to value or value of value. I argue that this not only is this principle self-validating, but that not to value value is self-defeating, self-negating and contradictory. And that the will to value leads to a certain sufficiency of value. But this cannot be argued here, which I have done previously in other workshops. Yet the relevance of the issue of monism and pluralism becomes apparent in the light of the above claim. That is, I am claiming a form of monism in promoting a unificatory solution to questions of value. Yet as my theories of ethics and meaning show, I accept pluralism in their material expression. My objective today is to explain how this can be done. In one of the most fundamental modern statements made about monism and pluralism, Isaiah Berlin cites what he calls three perennial dogmas of truth and knowledge in the Western world. These are that A. Every genuine question has one true answer and one only. B. The method which leads to correct solutions to all genuine problems is rational in character. And C. These solutions are true universally, eternally and immutably. Unquote. But to state the issue of monism and pluralism without qualification is a simplification. To begin with, there are many ways in which the issue of monism and pluralism is expressed. I will just give a few main examples of the very many expressions of monism and pluralism. It's expressed metaphysically as particulars and universals in Plato and Aristotle. It is expressed in modern philosophy of mind as physicalism and dualism or pluralism. Monism is expressed in science as a search for coherence and a unification of principles and laws. Monism and pluralism are expressed in theory of knowledge as a tension between rationalism and empiricism. And the distinction is expressed in ethics as a debate between objectivity and relativity. Yet of course the distinctions between these divisions is, are not as clear-cut as they might suggest, and it can be argued that these disciplines overlap to the point of indistinguishability. Yet monism and pluralism do represent particularly distinctive ways of thinking, so we can begin by <coughs> reviewing these different questions in turn. As implied above, the monist-pluralist debate in science takes the form of the rationalist-empiricist <coughs> distinction. And we can begin to discuss rationalism and empiricism in terms of Hume's fork. Note that Hume's fork isn't the same as Hume's law, 
as a principle that deals with ethics. Hume's fork makes a radical distinction between relations of ideas and matters of fact and existence. Matters of fact or scientific laws are discovered empirically and contingently and can be wrong. This contingency is seen in changes from Aristotelian and Newtonian to quantum science. Hume's point is that such principles are produced by numerous observations and experiments. But it doesn't matter how many observations are made, they are never complete or absolute. For example, prior to the Hubble telescope, it was thought that the expansion of the universe was slowing. Now, with the discovery of dark matter, we find that this expansion is speeding up. But this was totally this was a totally unexpected <coughs> discovery, contrary to scientific orthodoxy. Hume presents causality as an opaque process of observations that he describes as constant conjunctions. Conversely, relations of ideas operate on different principles such as necessity, reason and logic. That is, ideas can be logically ne necessary, such as one plus one equals two, or all husbands are male. Hume's empiricist account shows that science is, isn't governed by a single known principle or rational order. The pluralism here is represented by mm, empiricism, and monism is represented by, by rationalism. But I have another argument against the monist conception of science that includes both, mathema both mathematics and physics. That is, as above, physics is an a posteriori science of contingent observations about the physical world. But mathematics and logic make a priori judgments of necessary relations about abstractions. So both the content and methods of mathematics and physics are radically different. Unlike logic, physical science is contingent and diverse in principle. Therefore, empirical science is a, a pluralist and not a unified monistic discipline. Yet this conclusion contrasts with the earlier view of science as a search for a single unifying principle. The next version of the monist pluralist debate arises with respect to the character of mind. Physical monism argues that mind or consciousness is a very refined aspect of the material world. Dualism holds that mind and matter are radically different kinds of thing. Cartesian dualism is a particular kind of dualism. It sees mind as, as, as disconnected from the world and as having features like transparency and non-extension. Daniel Dennett is fixated on disproving Cartesian dualism. I reject it for other reasons, but we don't have time to argue this here, as which I have done extensively elsewhere. Yet for the sake of the monist pluralist debate, we can mention not only dualism, but pluralism. Pluralism is the view that there aren't just one or two species of being, as in physicalism or dualism, but many. Karl Popper, for example, maintains three species of existence, matter, mind, and its abstract products. Different versions of, of this view are held by Roger Penrose, Hubert Dreyfus, and Merleau Ponty. In support of pluralism, we can refer to the ontological status of mathematics and logic, as well as mind and physicality. Mathematical structures are not physical in any way. They are abstract through and through. Mathematical, logical or abstract ideas can exist <coughs> independently, for example, in a book, and are not states of mind. One argument for this form of ontological pl pluralism is thereby that 1. Mathematics exists, 2. It is neither physical or mental, 3. Therefore, it is a third species of existence. Some of the 
consequences or benefits of ontological pluralism are that, firstly, it provides an alternative to or moderates physicalism and dualism. And secondly, abstraction and physicality ontologically flank and thereby help to define mind or consciousness. Alternatively, in Saul Kripke's <coughs> argument against physicalism, he flanks mind <coughs> epistemologically. This brings us to a brief outline of epistemological monism or pluralism. Kant advocates an, epist an epistemological mo monism that conceptions of things must be whole or unified. He holds this on the grounds that if they were not whole or unified, we could not <coughs> apprehend them. Yet, does, yet Kant does believe in a, preconcept, in a preconceptual perception of things that he describes as the manifold. The manifold is a realm of disordered perceptions before they can be conceptualized by our minds. But in my view, conceptualization requires a contrast and distinctions of pluralism, not unified monist concepts. I've often given the example of a white spot needing contrast on a blackboard in order to be perceived, and every item within perception would similarly require a contrast with every other. And moreover, that perception requires a contrast against a wider background or context. This is a holistic or pluralistic account of perception or knowledge opposed to Kant. So now we can finally come to ethical, moral or evaluative accounts of monism and pluralism. Again we have different schools of thought that represent either monism or pluralism. Thinkers like Kant, Derek Parfit and Ronald Dworkin advocate ethical monism. Others like Hume, Berlin, w William and Simon Blackburn <coughs> advocate ethical pluralism. There are two aspects of Kant's ethics that reveal his monism. One is categorical imperative and two reason. Kant's c categorical imperative advocates three principles. Universal moral actions, treating people and as ends, and choosing the moral law for ourselves. Choosing to give the moral law to ourselves, and his motivation by duty, appears to be pluralistic and open. But Kant's moral law is definitive, and doing our duty, because it's right, is determined by pure reason alone. So his categorical imperative amounts to an attempt to formulate precise principles of action in all cases. This might be debatable, but the point here is to show Kant's monist view of moral action. Kant's appeal to reason was an understandable attempt to show how ethics must be objective in some way. But reason is subject to Hume's is ought constraint as well as other modern critiques of reason and logic. Yet Kant acknowledged subjective factors like intention and duty, as well as a need for objectivity. His problem is that reason is internal to the agent, but not internal to moral value choices. I will return to this problem shortly with the idea of consciousness as a universal. Yet Ronald Dworkin takes the idea of universal monist principles in ethics even further than Kant. Dworkin emphasizes the ordinary view as, as um, evidence of moral facts, like torturing babies for fun is wrong. But despite the attraction of such views, they are subject to critical redress. For example, the notion of torturing babies for fun is wrong in itself entails highly contested ideas of intrinsic value. John Mackey argues, for instance, that there are no objective values and consequently no intrinsic values. I agree with Mackey 
yet torturing babies is wrong, but for different reasons than Dworkin's. I find Dworkin's premise based on moral facts to be mistaken, yet he goes on to make universal moral claims. That is, a true interpretation will follow from the best account of moral facts that we can find. And Dworkin expects that the best account will arrive at one objectively true account. He tells us that, I quote, there must be a right answer to about the best thing to do. And he implies less clearly that there must only be one right answer. But his view that there must be a right answer about the best thing to do presupposes a particular kind of world. It is a world, or world view, undiversified by human choice and without preference about what is the best outcome. It is a one-dimensional world where everything can be quantified and compared on the same scale. It is a world of ungraduated minds with the same standards, criteria and principles of ethics. But perhaps worse, he ensures that there is one answer by imposing a system of right and wrong on the world. Yet such a particular theoretical system could only exist as an unworkable hypothesis. It could only work if everyone were to understand and agree to Dworkin's system of order. And that isn't just mm, unrealistic and erroneous, it is also it is also preposterous. Isaiah Berlin takes the opposite pluralist view to the monism of Kant and Dworkin above. Berlin's pluralist view of values nevertheless takes the view that all values share the same status as values. But there isn't a single universal table on which you can place these values in a definite hierarchy. Yet he accepts that, in practice, some values can be legitimately ranked above, uh, <coughs> above others. There are a number of consequences of Berlin's value pluralism, some of which we can discuss. One is his view that not all the supreme values of mankind are compatible. And similarly, he endorses the widely accepted view that contradictory moral goods can coexist. And lastly, that we cannot always morally judge other cultures from different times. On the potential incompatibility of human goods or values, Berlin reminds us that freedom or liberty must be weighed against many other values, such as mm, equality or justice or happiness or security or public order. This further illustrated by his classic work, Two Concepts of Liberty. These are negative liberty and positive liberty, known as freedom from interference and freedom to act. Yet their full mutual expression can involve social conflict and human frustration. The other consequence of Berlin's pluralism is that we can't morally judge other cultures of different times. He writes that there can, there can exist no super standard for the comparison of entire scales of value, which itself derives from no specific set of beliefs, no one specific culture. Unquote. This means we cannot say, for instance, that life today is better than life was in ancient Greece. Berlin says this because the cultures are different, their values are different, and their criteria are internal to those, to those cultures. And it can't be maintained that we are in a privileged position to judge at the end of human progress. But for people living in slavery, that seems to be an obviously worse condition than present conditions. Yet what Berlin means by this apparent justification of slavery is that we live in a different constellation of values and that we have to understand the world in which there were slaves in, uh, and their different outlook. And entire outlooks 
can't be strung along a line in which one is superior to another. So Berlin and some other pl pluralists hold that past or future mm, societies can't be m morally better or worse because they judge their lives by different values and that the only values that they can be judged by are, by, are their own, internal to their cultures. In one way, this view is correct. In another, it is mistaken. It's correct because the judgments of moral values have their own criteria, but those internal criteria aren't totally relative. In my view, there are common normative features. At one level, I've advocated structures of conscious, consciousness and value like the will to value. Yet even at social and historical levels, values are different to today's in some ways, but are the same in other ways. We can say, for example, that there are basic ways in which all <coughs> society's values are the same. That is, they are different in degree, but not of a kind that will lead to a contradiction. That is, not of differences of the same kind that will lead to a contradiction as Berlin holds. These are basic values like people not wanting their lives to end or not wanting to end prematurely. All people in all societies generally want to avoid pain and to pursue happiness. And all people similarly want material and emotional security. The point is that these are common values by which societies judge themselves. And because they judge themselves by these values, we can also judge them by the same values. Yet the values of different peoples are also different in some ways. The question is, are they so different that we cannot legitimately judge other societies? For example, in a society that accepts slavery, can we condemn them m morally for accepting slavery? We can make a useful distinction here between, moral between morals and ethics. We might not be able to make a moral judgment about people who don't know any better, but we can make an ethical judgment that, from a wider point of view, slavery is unethical. Yet it is just the, applic the applicability of that wider point of view that is in question. I'll come back to that question shortly. But we can also make an ethical judgment that just, for the, just from the point of view of slaves, slavery is unethical. That is, slaves don't want to be slaves. And we shouldn't privilege the culture of slavers over slaves. To do so seems to be co contradictorily adopting a monist view of such a mixed slave culture. And are we are still judging that culture from a perspective within that culture? Yet this argument may not work where there is no group of dissenting people to claim certain moral values. For example, anarchists or groups of sexually licentious people may agree on their non-harming behaviour. And it might not be legitimately argued that such behaviour is always harmful. Then obvious examples of slavery and torturing babies wouldn't hold because, vac because victims don't exist. And because no harm is done and there is no dissent, nothing here would be immoral. Yet have nevertheless proposed a number of criteria or better or worse values that need not imply morals. These are criteria of coherence, consistency, quality, self-validation and sufficiency of value. And none of the above arguments for or against monism or pluralism have considered these criteria. And there is another kind of neglected distinction we can make about judging other peoples and cultures. That is, the capacity to value is different in different people that can be seen more clearly in other animals. That is, there is a question of animal rights about why and to what extent we should respect animals. In my view, one of the criteria is 
to the extent to which animals value their own existence. I previously argued for graduations of consciousness and consequently gra graduations in the capacity to value. I've also argued for animal desires as values in the forms of seeking, reproduction, nourishment and pleasure. And in my view, animals don't have a capacity for moral values. That is because they lack reflective consciousness needing for making moral judgments. Yet also in my view, humans differ in levels of awareness but don't differ markedly in levels of consciousness. Except in non-standard cases like infants, the comatose and in advanced senility. So this argument can't be used to justify moral judgments for different human cultures. But the notions of graduated consciousness and criteria of value bring a new perspective to at the monist pluralist debate. And because of this, both Kantian monists and Berlin's pl pluralists can be said to be mistaken. Kantian monists are mistaken because they attempt to find unity in reason or some kind of normative fact or truth. They also attempt to formulate rules of conduct for every conceivable circumstance. On my view, normative, uh, normativity can be based on structures of consciousness instead of reason, and action can be guided by correct value judgments. On the other hand, Berlin and other pl pluralists are mistaken for the same reasons. That is, Berlin makes no mention of consciousness and value as a common basis for diverse values. Berlin's moral order is derived through historical, social, political and psychological forces. And Berlin's pl pluralism that lacks the above monism is illustrated by his views on meaning and purpose in life. Berlin cites his favourite thinker on this as the Russian re revolutionary Alexander H Hudson. He quotes Hudson saying that the purpose of life is life. And that's what Berlin believes. He says that the pur purpose of life isn't ha happiness, truth or security, although these are important values. The purpose of life for him is to continue life, and to go on being alive. But I don't su accept such an inadequate answer, especially from such a great thinker as Berlin. And clearly, to give a unitary answer to the question of meaning would contradict Berlin's monism. Yet Berlin is right to think that, in practice at least, meaning in life comes from a multiplicity of things, and that blood is often spilt by Islamists, neo-fascists or communists proclaiming a single answer. Yet in my view, both material pluralism and monist principles of ethics and meaning can be derived from value. That is, they can't be ultimately derived from cognition, affect or the will alone. They are derived from the structures and dynamics of consciousness and value as I have explained them. And these principles include the affirmation or will to value as the value of value. And this includes a self-validation of value resulting in a certain sufficiency of value. So as my conclusion, I have a greater affinity to pluralism than monism, but with some important qualifications. That is, that pluralism offers a more open and diverse approach to understanding the human condition. But like orthodox monism, it neglects the integrating concepts of consciousness and value. This might be expected given my error theory of consciousness and value. Yet monism and pluralism do represent ways of thinking that we can review. In philosophy of mind, monism is represented by physicalism that regards mind as refined aspects of matter. Physicalism expresses a way of thinking voiced by pa Parmenides in saying all is one. And this 
legitimate aspiration to find unity of understanding is also found in science. Science is looking for a coherent understanding of the world under the same laws or principles. One expression of this is an attempt to unify the nuclear, gravitational and, e and electromagnetic forces. This attempt is admirable and legitimate, but as we have seen, it can be seriously misplaced. For example, mathematic mathematical abstractions are radically different from the constituents of physics. Science goes further astray in attempting to establish moral values even though values are aspects of consciousness. Yet the influence of scientific methods are pervasive in philosophy and the humanities. And it's in this respect that Isaiah Berlin's criticisms of scientific monism are most valuable. But Berlin's pl pluralism and scientific and other forms of monism are both subject to further criticism. Ethical monism attempts to formulate principles to determine action in every conceivable circumstance. Yet Berlin's pl pluralism is left without any general pr principle of ethics, meaning or purpose. My solution is to derive general principles from the, in, from the integrative concepts of consciousness and value. And the generality of consciousness and value allows for the diversity of human action in the world. This approach accommodates the advantages of both the openness and pluralism and the unity of monism. Yet to access this view, we need the integrative concepts of consciousness and value. So let me have your comments and criticisms at the meeting or at websites like zoom or meetup.com.